Hello and welcome back to the Pirate Rugby. If you're new here, please consider subscribing and leaving us a review. We are very close to a thousand subscribers on YouTube now. So if you could help us get there, it would be really appreciated. But without further ado, without wasting any more time, let me introduce this week's guest and we have a special treat for you today. You may not know his face, but you will almost certainly know his voice. Rugby commentator and all-round legend Dave Rogers is with me. Hello, how are you, sir? You can't have a pirate podcast without a Jolly Rogers. <laughs> that oh, that just came to me and it sounded it like a road bit. It's, I, oh, it's, it's not, it wasn't great, was it? Um, this is fun, isn't it? I'm looking forward to having a chat. I'm very, very well, actually. Uh, the sun's shining for a change. Uh, I am in East London, so hopefully it's shining on you wherever you are. Um, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. It is reasonably shiny in the English Midlands, and I'm hoping that that <laughs> shine will make its way to Gloucester later this evening, where I'm seeing a bit of European Rugby Cup action, but we'll talk a bit more about all that in due course. But yes, I like to research my guests. Unfortunately, you don't have a Wikipedia page, uh, I can tell you. No, absolutely not. And I think I'll refuse to forever. But you do have a LinkedIn profile. So oh, do I? Crikey. Well, I've not been on that for a while. So uh, so update me. Let me know. So it says that you have commentated on 50 sports at an elite level. Does it? OK. Yeah, yeah. that's not far off yet. OK, so that's it. It says uh, that you have an 11 handicap in golf. Yes. Well, yeah. All right. Yeah. It says that you're a terrible footballer. Correct. And it says that you're reluctant to do podcasts. Does it really? It does. Well, and here so, we are. Welcome to the Pirate Rugby Podcast. <laughs> What's the so, point of having a mind if you're not willing to change it, eh? Well, there there, there it goes. So just 50, 50 elite sports. Surely you yeah. can't name them all. So you've done the Olympics as well as rugby and things like that, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. So um, there are different ways into commentary. And I'm sure the more commentators you meet, the more people will tell you the, the weird and wonderful way that they got in. Uh, my evolution was that I discovered I had the show off gene pretty early and I like to be involved with microphones and live events so I was uh, I was a musician for a while I sang uh, but I always loved sport and so I became a stadium announcer doing well not always stadiums competitions oh, yeah. various sports uh, so doing friends favors and that led to the Olympics London 2012 which was my first big gig at Earl's Court doing the indoor volleyball, which was incredible. Um, and so, yeah, I've been lucky enough to do the last three Summer Olympics. So, uh, yeah, London and then Rio and then Japan. Talking about Paris, it's not signed on the on the dotted line yet, but I'd love to do a fourth in Paris. I mean, what a city, what an event. Um, so, yeah, the, the stadium announcing became a little bit of presenting, uh, became a little bit of something else. And, and even though... I wanted to commentate on rugby opportunities weren't particularly forthcoming, but I knew that I loved broadcast and live streaming and that that dopamine hit of the whistle going and anything could happen. So if there was an opportunity to commentate on anything, um, I would give it a go. So there are sports in there that you will be familiar with. So all of the rugby codes, I've done sevens and fifteens. I've done nines. I've done tens. I've done rugby league. Um, all throughout. I mean, in the last few weeks alone, I've done full internationals and under 11, sevens at, at Roslyn Park. But there is oh, some fantastic. some quite interesting ones in there as well. So uh, goal ball isn't a sport that a lot of people are familiar with, but it's a sport for blind teams of three where there's a bell in the ball and you've got to be completely silent in the arena. So that makes commentary. It sounds a little bit more like <laughs> like this than uh, than my usual Tombra. Maybe you can uh, go into snooker one day with that. Well, do you know what? Snooker, I think, is the one sport where I wouldn't be able to do it because you've got to be such an expert in the game. So I can very rarely, I'd be like, oh, yeah, well, if you pot that red, you might be able to pot the black. But when you listen to the great <laughs> snooker commentators, they're already planning the table clearance, aren't they? Uh, one of the weirdest ones, uh, no, weird is the wrong word, one of the one of the ones that was different to anything that I've ever done before was uh, wheelchair ballroom dancing, the para dance sport European Championships in Germany. That was, uh, I mean, it was an amazing event with some astonishing athletes. But it is, 
a lot different to Ospreys versus Scarlets at the Swansea.com yes. arena, let me tell you. I can't even I can't even picture that. I'm gonna have to YouTube it later. I'm sure it's very fabulous and very elegant. It's just yeah, that is a that is unusual as you as you said. So how how does someone learn how to commentate? Is there schools? Is there TED Talks? Is there YouTube tutorials? How do you not go erm all the time? Because like sometimes I listen back to myself podcasting and I cringe at how often I just go uh in which case I'll try not to do that during this conversation. <laughs> it's really it's quite difficult to explain. I mean, there are traditional methods. So historically, you'd you'd get a job with somebody like the BBC. You'd express an interest in commentary and as well as your regular day to day tasks, whatever they were, making tea, photocopying, a little bit of journalism, there might be an opportunity or they would send you out to one of the regions and they kind of just throw you in at the deep end. I think now there are more vocational courses in colleges and universities, aren't there, where they'll try and give you a full journalistic toolkit to allow you to be a fully tooled up media droid and take on the world. Um, 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 there's three of them. <laughs> but I think mine was was more a case of becoming comfortable around the idea that you are live and you have a microphone and anything can happen. And as long as you're not intimidated by that, and as long as you're armed with enough knowledge about the laws of the sport that you're covering and the magnitude of the event or the fixture, then you're going to be all right. And I think because I always loved rugby and played rugby and was a fan of rugby, but my introduction to the world of sport was through volleyball which wasn't a sport that I knew particularly well I thought right well if I can do that in a sport that I didn't grow up with but you know I learned to love it and I and I absolutely adore it now it's a it's it, rugby and volleyball are the two sports that I that I cover mostly then there's nothing to be scared of give it a go you can commentate on this and without what I just sound like a big old capitalist the market decides doesn't it if you're mm. if you're all right you'll get a go if you're not, you won't. And maybe in time you can improve and get that go. So so here we are. So I think a lot of people would assume with a commentator that you'd have you've got one big game on the Saturday or the Sunday and you you build up for that and things. How many let's just get, stick here to just rugby matches. How many rugby matches do you do in a normal week? Uh, hey, look, I'm it's difficult to say this without sounding like a bit of a prat, to be honest, but I'm. I'm pretty busy and I'm very lucky, but it does mean that I have to be very organized with my time, which is something that I'm not particularly good at. So um, this week, for example, I've got a Japan Rugby League one game uh, very early Saturday morning. Then I've got a URC game Saturday evening. No, I'm telling you, Porky Pies. Let's let's do this. Let's do this Saturday because I'm actually I'm not doing any European rugby uh, this Saturday. I'm going to visit my friends at the Bedford Blues, and I'm filling in for Sam Roberts. The championship. Oh, I'm Sam. Yeah. In, yeah, Sam is a who's a good friend of ours, good friend of the podcast, and he is like you cut him open and he bleeds Bedford Blues. He loves that club, and the club love him. So if he's not available, sometimes I'm lucky enough to go up there and. Goldington Road's a great place to experience rugby. So if you or any of your listeners have a, a Saturday where you're looking to go to a new ground, go go visit the guys at Goldington Road. Massive derby against Amped Hill as well. So uh, I'm excited to be involved with that. Uh, so yeah, Saturday morning, I'll be up and I am doing Blue Revs versus Spears in Japan Rugby League One. Then I'm heading slightly north for me uh, to do Bedford Blues. Then uh, I've got another game on Sunday massive day for me on Wednesday because it is the Buck Super Rugby and Women's National League finals at the Stonex. Oh yeah. Then I know I've you're got, a big fan of that. Oh, I love it. I I I adore it. I to be fair, I adore all the leagues that I cover, but that one's got a special place. Uh then on Thursday I've got an Indigo Premiership game in Ebu Vale. And then on Saturday I've got a URC game. So that is a particularly busy week. There are a few other things happening there as well because it's the Quad Nations Championship, which is a, a warm up for the Paralympic wheelchair rugby. So, top four teams in the world. We've got USA, Canada, Great Britain, Japan, 
Three of those teams will probably be medalists in Paris. Uh, they're playing in Cardiff, so I'm doing that on the Tuesday. Uh, and I've got a couple of games of volleyball as well because it's coming into the final throws of the Italian Serie A in both the men's and the women's. So we're into the semi-finals of the playoffs. So when I say it all out loud like that, it does sound quite busy, actually. Um, but yeah, so so on a particularly packed week like that, a lot of time will be spent dedicated uh, to the to the research, making sure that I've got all my preparation right. And then uh, there's a nice mixture between being on site in the ground, pressing the flesh and, and calling it up close. And for the volleyball and for some of the rugby, including the Japan Rugby League one, frustratingly, they don't fly us out for every game. Uh, so I do it from the very position I'm talking to you in now with this headset on at this standing desk and uh, an incredibly smart piece of software sends me the pictures of the game. I commentate on them. My co-commentator, I'll be looking at them like I'm looking at you now, a little picture in picture. Um and yeah, we 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 call the game from wherever we are in the world. It's quite amazing, really. Wow, that that does sound absolutely packed. Yeah, yeah, so, it is. I, I, I've I've just said it all out loud. I'm like, oh my god, so much work. <laughs> so with with the with the prep, you know, I remember seeing a um, a clip about Bill McLaren, the legendary yeah. commentator, and he would use playing cards to memorize players' names. Um, okay, and he'd write, I've not write seen their that. name on the playing card. So how, do you have a way like that? Do you have a specific crib sheet? Is there like a, a standard commentator's way or do you have like, what's your research and preparation look like? Um, I think everybody's got different ways of doing things that make them feel comfortable, but they all boil down to the same thing, which is give yourself what you need on the day to do the best job that you can. So uh, Nick Mullins very often puts his on social media doesn't he and he's got beautiful handwriting and he does the the colored pens with the bits of research and stuff like that uh my team sheets they look similar to that uh in so much that it's got a big number and a big name and then a little bit of information about that player the requisite information date of birth height weight number of tries they've scored whether or not they've scored in previous games against the opponents uh, perhaps something that's been going on in their life recently that you can entertain or educate the viewer with uh, but all of mine now is digital so on the day I'll make sure I've got backups on backups on backups I'll have a printed copy I'll have a copy on an iPad um, just to make sure that no matter what goes right or wrong on the day I'm still covered I mean a few times I really came unstuck early on. So I used to I used to keep everything in a book so I'd have all my commentary notes in order. Uh, so I actually started out as a football commentator more than a rugby commentator. And I worked at Leicester City the season that they got promoted from the championship to the premiership. And I had all my notes in a book. And I was like, right, so I can reference them back. And it looked really nice. It was a nice thing to keep, which is fine until I drove to work and I'd left it on the table at home and I was like oh my god what am I going to do now so over the years the the more experience I've got the more I've thought well if I do this digitally uh, I do it all on google sheets so it's all on the cloud I've got it there so if my I don't know if if my notes blow away I can look at it on an iPad if I drop my iPad I can look at it on my laptop if my laptop runs out of battery I can look at it on my phone so I have always got everything that i need to make sure that i can do the best job that i can backups on backups when i was at uni we were marked on our on our log books i did an engineering degree and uh we started to in our, our notes in google sheets and my tutor told me off said no you need to be doing engineers should have a physical notebook and we were all saying but we could lose that with that could yeah. we could leave that at home it could get water damage where if it it's here it's safer and he was like no good engineer always carries a physical notebook so I'm reading my questions for you today off a notebook, so maybe <laughs> that, that stuck in my head eventually. Uh, a good friend of mine is a, is a pilot, and he set up a company around making the process of applying for pilot's jobs 
a lot cleaner than it currently is. And one of the things that they are are doing and are at the forefront of is digitizing pilot logs because exactly the same for years and years and years, it's so important to log every minute of flying that you do. It might be hours, might be minutes, whatever, units of time. And they've been doing it by hand for years. Well, what if you lose that? So yeah. I, I think what they're actually doing is it's a digital format, but then it prints it out in order and people are still putting them in whatever they are, journals or anything like that. So so I I understand it. But but right now, for example, um, so the Buck Super Rugby in the Women's National League finals, uh, I'm going to be presenting the men's and commentating on the women's and Joe Burns is going to be reporting on the women's commentating on the men's so I've I did the semi-final I did Loughborough they're going to have a very similar team so we've got a great relationship but I can just send in my notes and I can well, talk right, to him and I'll be like mate great here's an email with an attachment I mean it would be well I suppose it wouldn't be that difficult now to just snap a photo of something that you've done in pen but it makes it a lot easier to share resources to back it up and and for me then to have a personal reference point as well like throughout the season throughout the seasons um I think it's quite nice to have it all written down and uh, yeah I think I think Nick Mullins look absolutely beautiful but I've decided to try at least to to bring it into the 21st century and it's it's going all right I'm I'm nearly there I've still got some little bits to refine but I'm nearly there so there's quite a lot of camaraderie among commentators is there it's not like a oh bastard I wanted to do that game oh, he's um, got it again he's rubbish uh, uh, yeah I, I mean I'm 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 lucky that I've got a really good group of pals and we're all of a similar success level and we all try and help each other out i'm sure i don't know i'm sure there there will have been times where i was just you know on the outside peeking over the the fence like bloody hell i wish you'd let me in where where i might have thought oh, why is he bloody doing that and and perhaps if i wasn't where i was at i might be i might be a little more but particularly with the way that rugby is now and even though there are probably fewer big shiny broadcast jobs where you can you know that are very glamorous and you can earn a boatload of money there is more and more rugby being put out there more and more platforms that it's being put out on more and more games being live streamed so there are opportunities there and I think one of the reasons why I do it and one of the reasons why I love the sport so much is because in the main there's a lot of really nice people really interesting people really helpful people who've got time for you and they've got great stories and great experiences um which again is is perhaps one of the reasons why i've been i've covered the 50 sports and it's the rugby and the and the volleyball that have really drawn me in because those are the the two sports that have been full of fun great excellent well, people they say in um professional musicians the ones who are like the backing guys for someone like i don't know an Aussie osborne or a uh someone like that who is just in in the band they say like you, how good you are at hanging out is as important as how good you are at your instrument because they don't want to be with someone who's going to give them a headache for six days of the week absolutely um yeah absolutely you but if you're going if you're going on tour and i, I suppose that's another crossover between uh, between sport and music isn't it you want people who've got good energy people who get it and i think that is a uh, yeah that's that's an absolutely massive thing and you know very often those those guys who are session players the talent level that they've got is absolutely outstanding i'm just uh i'm just trying to think of the name of a guy i went to see john mayer a couple of years ago and his he had a backing singer guitarist who did a solo a singing solo not a ah, oh, what is his name it's not Robbie McIntosh. Robbie McIntosh was the was the grey haired guy who played the slide guitar. He was absolutely outstanding, and he's got Pino Palladino, who's the Long famous bass. bassist, yeah. um, who just literally just stood at the back of the stage all night with his sunglasses on and his pink bass and his flat wound strings, just yeah. looking like the cool fellow Welshman. By the way, Pino Palladino. Oh, what have you got there? That's, this is my Fender Precision. Sorry, Robbie podcast, but this is my Fender Precision. If I was to turn the camera that way you'd see my big stand of guitars and things so that's my other other hobby david ryan harris uh, look him up 
he is outstanding but yeah great vibes guy immensely talented just the kind of person you'd want on your team because a really good egg and incredibly talented so let me i'm gonna ask you insert cheeky question here do you ever have bets and go like i bet you can't say this word or i bet you can't oh so many times so many times so many times more less so these days but back when i was doing a lot of um a lot of live events so sometimes if you do a multi-sport event um so i've done the olympics and the commonwealth games you've got a team and again it's all about being a team player directors producers floor managers camera operators sound engineers lighting engineers big teams and the days are really long it's not like i mean rugby days are long for some people particularly those who who rig and set up the trucks they can be there for sort of 12 or 14 hours but everyone is in at the crack of dawn you do a full day and then you leave at the end of the day so i'll generally do a team sport like volleyball or handball for those and and at the olympics they're the ones that last the longest so by day eight or nine when even though the sport's amazing it's a little bit like groundhog day because you know you go in you have your breakfast you do two games there's a break there's another two games there's a break there's another two games and it's done at the end it's absolutely wild so um best case scenario is dave can you try and say the word pterodactyl worst case scenario <laughs> because everyone knows that everything's going to run um I'll have my my in ear in, you know, the little headphones that they pop in you so they can communicate with you. Everyone's so sure that the show is going to go well because it has gone well for the 20 games you've done before. They're just having a conversation while you're trying <laughs> to have a conversation. So me and you are trying to trying to conduct an interview about what's coming up. Or, you know, I might be chatting to a kid in the audience about, oh, is this your first time watching handball? Uh, what do you think of Paris? Um, I'm subliminally saying Paris, so they give me a gig. Uh, and then, yeah, there's just somebody talking about, oh, do you think I should go to Mallorca or Dubai? And I'm like, I wish you would shut up, please, please. I can't concentrate. Um, so, yeah, there are, there are quite a few. There are quite a few things like that that, that happen. But please don't tell everyone. Okay, I promise not to tell anybody <laughs> other than everybody who watches and listens to this podcast. Well, a thousand um, subscribers, baby. Come on. Maybe by the time I put this out. No, no, let's not jinx it. Um, so with the the kind of setup, you set, you're obviously like the, the lead guy and doing yeah. the most of the commentating. And then you've got your pundit who would yes. work with you. And if we just keep it strictly to, to rugby for now. Yeah. It, is that... Is that a bit of a, div- a divide? And divide is the wrong word. It makes it sound negative. Is that a bit of a, there's commentators and there's pundits. And the pundits are normally ex-players who aren't maybe necessarily broadcasters by nature, let's say. Yeah, I think so. Um, well, in fact, I know so. I know so, really. And I think that's that's how it works. I don't think it's fair to not call them broadcasters because really none of us are broadcasters. You just... You know, you throw your hat in the ring. You think it's something that you can do. And by the grace and good faith of somebody, a producer or an exec or, or a director or whatever, they'll give you a go and, and, and you get the opportunity to do so. And some people can do it and some people um, and some people can't. And those who can continue and those who don't end up doing something else. And I, I think sometimes with with television and, and live streaming and platforms, a lot of people get into it thinking that they want to be a presenter or a commentator or a reporter but really subconsciously they just want to be involved with the making of that and i don't think it's until you get involved you realize how many incredibly cool jobs there are like floor managing like producing like being a camera operator or a multi-camera director or or any of these things that are such integral cogs so for example, my my wife is a, a producer and a series producer in comedy entertainment TV, and I speak to her about it all the time. The, the, for her, the idea of presenting is like, oh no, not for me. But the idea of not making television is is terrible uh, and unthinkable. Whereas for me, it's the fact that it's live and it's happening now that I get my buzz from. So, you know, her contracts might last three six nine months where you're just aiming towards this one thing whereas my skill set doesn't work that way and i'd be terrible at it you know the whistle goes i start the whistle goes again i stop so with regards to bringing x players in 
I mean, why wouldn't you? You've got all these people who can guide them through giving all of their years and years of knowledge and experience to the viewer or the listener. It's it's absolutely amazing. And and the beauty from from my professional and personal perspective is that I love I love rugby. I love rugby. I love watching rugby. Don't love playing rugby anymore. Hurts too mm. much. But I love <laughs> watching rugby. I love learning about rugby and well, th- this this season alone, some of the people I've been able to share a broadcast with and just stand alongside, I've learned so much from people like Richie Reese and Sam Warburton and, and Flats and Austin Healy and, and Tom Shanklin and James Hook and um, Mark Jones. I mean, Mark Jones, who's the defence coach at, the at Ospreys, Ospreys, yeah. uh, Ospreys now, former former Wales player, mid-Wales, uh, yeah, mid-Wales boy, actually, built Wales. Um, Scarlet, like most people in the Australian. Yeah, 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 <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, just just hearing he he's incredible. The, the, all those guys are incredible, and the speed at which it goes from their brains to their mouths, and they can sort of digest it and, and spew it out in a way that we can all understand it, is is truly amazing. So they, by having somebody like me who's just able to go play by play by play, name by name by name. Um, phase by phase by phase just allows them the time to see what's going on and then as soon as they contribute they do and I I think that balance works works beautifully yeah well there's a it feels like there's maybe it's always feels like this and I'm just noticing it more now there's a real fresh wave of people coming into the commentary box and people like Sam Walton who are so fresh out of it and yeah. are able to articulate the modern game in such a more in well um, being maybe a bit unfair to some of the older guys but in, in such an interesting way that's so insightful because they can yeah. t- um, talk about the intricacies of modern especially at test match level things that weren't the case even five years ago that the game has moved on so much i think particularly as well i've been watching the women's six nations and some of the some of the women's pundits and presenters on that are absolutely sensational oh absolutely i'll tell you a, i'll tell you a dark horse to look out for in the future is Bryony Cleal. She was injured a couple of years ago, and I did a few Premier 15s, as it was then, games with her. And they were her first ever games. And her natural charisma and her ability to express that, particularly around areas of the set piece, the scrum and the line out, just quietly in my head, I thought, you are going to go places. She was absolutely phenomenal one of the one of the best i've i've worked with across across all sports absolutely outstanding oh fantastic i'll definitely keep uh, an eye out for her so when you say you've got a really big game whether it's for tnt or itv or something like that do you have like pre-production meetings with it and you and you'll go you know i'm going to use the word narrative you say this is the narrative leading into the game with this player or this team or this coach and we want you during the the match to be talking about it to, to to hit these narrative points do, do, does that happen i'm sure if that sounds a bit cynical but is it that um, is there a level of pre-planning that goes into it and you get asked to focus on certain things uh, i i don't get asked to focus on certain things because i think once the game is underway the most important thing is is to call the game straight down the line and don't allow any pre-biases that you may have to cloud what comes out of your mouth as as the game is happening and that's something that i really try not to do Uh, you know if if something happens call it as it is so i used to train audio describers for for blind and visually impaired um commentary for football clubs because that was how i sort of cut my teeth as a commentator and because you're working for a football club the most difficult thing to do is to encourage the commentators not to be biased so if everyone well say you're a radio commentator or you're an audio describer nobody who's listening to you can see what's going on because they're blind or they're visually impaired so if you are biased again i'll use leicester city as an example i don't support leicester but i did a lot of commentary for them so if i describe what's going on through a leicester city prism and then at the end of the season leicester city finish 18th in the league but I've said oh Leicester were robbed Leicester should have had a penalty that goal should have been disallowed 
then all of the supporters who've listened to my commentary are going to think, oh, well, we're the, we're the best team in the league. We've been hard done by. How did we finish 18th? How did we get relegated? Whereas if you are honest and if you've got integrity and if you give the viewers the, the, the straight down the line opinion, then they can come to their own conclusions, can't they? So in terms of those narrative points, I mean, I think that the TNT in particular do a really good job of looking at maybe what the rivalry is, maybe at looking what um, who the star of the show is. So I know uh, before Northampton Saints uh, last 16 victory the other day, they sent Laura Jane Jones out and she did a really good piece with Finn Smith, for example. So you can build a narrative around Finn Smith in the build-up in the hope that he has an absolute stormer. You are vindicated in your decision to do that and then you can reference it post-match as well. But in terms of uh, building a narrative to suit the play that happens in the 80 minutes, then no, if that makes Uh, sense. uh, it, it does make sense. And it's really interesting because I think fans are, and I include myself, all fans are like this in every sport. It's not just rugby fans. It's not just a particular set are all very, can be very tinfoil hatty. And, and when it comes to a lot of things, oh, a lot of time, there's, and there's a conspiracy against us and things. And the commentator hates us and stuff like that. Uh, no, no, no commentator hates any team. If we hated, if we hated rugby or rugby teams, then we wouldn't do what we do. We do it because we love rugby. Yeah. So speaking of kind of on that topic then, so uh, rugby at the moment is is more and more going behind paywalls. We've seen that the Autumn Internationals has gone to TNT, which seems to be positioning itself as the rugby broadcaster for the UK. Um, and what, what's, your, what's your kind of thoughts on that? The Premiership has currently got one game a month or a week on ITV. D, we've seen Rugby Pass TV is starting to broadcast more, which is free, but it's only for games that don't already have a paid broadcaster in the UK. Do you think that going to a subscription model for particularly club rugby is the right move? Or do you think that free to air, you know, some people will die on the hill that it should always be free to air. It's an it's a national right along those lines. I think it's really, really difficult. I think it's really, really difficult in a sport that is struggling financially to find ways to generate revenue. And a way to generate revenue is by negotiating a good deal for your broadcast rights. And we've seen the difference that has made in France to French rugby. They have got two incredibly competitive professional men's divisions and I've just come off the back of the men's and women's under 18 Six Nations their men's team lost to Georgia which is absolutely bonkers and brilliant for Georgian rugby and brilliant for the for the global rugby game but you know if you watch that game back 70 minutes in under 18s it's a game that France should have put to bed in the first half didn't and then came unstuck a lot like the men's team against Italy in the in the senior Six Nations uh, but in the women's under 18s Six Nations, the French team were outstanding and their core skills were as good as anything I've ever seen at that age group. So what they've been able to do there with the money that has come from the broadcast deal has paid dividends and may continue to pay dividends for a long, long time until until other countries are able to replicate whatever they're doing there. Um in terms of in terms of rugby as a as a free to air product, I just want as many people watching the game as possible. And I know that there are various divisions who are making an effort to do that. So Premiership Women's Rugby is on uh is behind a paywall at the moment on TNT, but Clubs are being encouraged to live stream their non-TX games. So I know that Harlequins, anytime they're not on TNT, if they're playing at the stoop, then they've put their hands in their pocket to fund the live stream. I know that Saracens uh, have done the same. I don't think for all their games, but certainly for some of their games. And I know that that um, Paul Morgan and Belinda Moore are looking at ways to supplement the 
paywall by putting on some live streams on the PWR YouTube. Uh, they did it for the mm-hmm. uh, for the Ealing Trailfinders game when they did the Superpower Weekend and then the Saracens game uh, the following day as well. Um, there is lots of of great rugby that is that is free to air. So in Wales on a Thursday night, hipster rugby, you got the Indigo Premiership. Uh, so they do one round a week. It's in it's Welsh language studio, but there's English language commentary available. Mm. Yeah. Um, Bucks Super Rugby on a Wednesday as well. Uh, they're putting out as many games as they can. But again, it is it is budgetary. Even to put on a live stream costs costs money. So I would love, I would absolutely love to say, do you know what? BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5, stick it on for nothing and get as many eyeballs. But there, there needs to be there needs to be a a compromise somewhere. So, you know, like Premier League football, Premier Ship football, Premier, the, the top level of football since it went from Division One has never, ever, ever, ever been free to air. And Sky Sports were able to build a behemoth off the back of it. Now, I think there needs to be the acceptance and there's there's a reluctance among rugby fans to to admit that football is a is a bigger deal than rugby it just it just is like it it just is um and that at some point if you want to watch rugby you are going to have to pay for it because it's a professional sport now players need playing staff need paying um coaches and, and medics and all of these people need paying so whether it's putting your hand in your pocket to buy a ticket or a subscription, then at some point it's going to cost you something. I think where people start to get a little bit catchy is if all of a sudden you're buying a subscription to TNT and Sky Sports and Viaplay and Rugby Pass and whatever else is the next thing along that's trying to get that extra five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten pounds euros dollars whatever currency it is um yeah i think that's that's where the that's where the frustration builds personally i think in terms of premiership rugby i think tnt are are doing a a very good job and i'm quite interested to see how that evolves over the next couple of years and how it changes from the bt sport days i would love for the six nations in particular, and the Rugby World Cup, men's and women's, to remain free to wear. Personally, that's quite important to me. I can see that. I think a lot of people would agree with that. Yeah, my colleague and co-presenter Ender does a, a thing on Twitter called the Rugby Broadcast TV Guide, where it says if you want to watch this game, it is on this channel at this time. And things with like things with the Challenge Cup, you absolutely need it because it's yeah almost impossible to keep on top of where everything is. Well, the Challenge Cup, the Challenge Cup changes changes year on year. So I did a couple of Challenge Cup games a few seasons ago, and I did them remotely from where I'm talking to you from now. And they tried to put them out on the CPR website, and now thankfully they've got a broadcast deal. So you know the the quality of the the camera work and the studio offering and everything improves. But because it runs concurrently with the Champions yeah. Cup, but the format is different, it's it is difficult to follow. Definitely. And there's now so many teams in both the Champions Cup and the Challenge Cup that for, for us, you know, our thing on the Pirate Rugby is we try to cover all the rugby all the time and yeah. it just becomes unmanageable. It just oh. becomes. Yeah, yeah, I I, I get it to, to the point where and, you know, I'll I'll admit this. There are some there are some games that I cover where I'm not always sure the platforms that they're going out on. Really? Particularly, um, particularly with the with the commentary stuff. So I know I know that the uh, Japan Rugby League one stuff, Rugby Pass are taking it now, uh, TVNZ are taking it, and ESPN Africa are taking it. But there could be some more channels taking it because it's a world feed commentary. It's available for any territory to purchase. But I haven't got I haven't got the full list, which I know sounds bonkers. Um, but yes. It's a it's a great global sport with so many brilliant players and stories and leagues to follow. 
and thankfully you're on top of where to follow them. Yeah. So I want to ask you about a league you just mentioned there, the Japanese League One. So that's something that you've been getting up very early in the morning to watch. Yes. It is something that we have only just been able to catch some live games thanks to Rugby Pass TV. I think there's a lot of preconceptions about it because whenever you see clips on social media, it's always of someone like Lou Diego or Adi Severo or something scoring a hat trick in a game from 50 meters out. Yeah. And it creates the impression that, oh, like, quote unquote, proper players go over there and tear up. And then, you know, the, the standard isn't quite there. That's not my impression, having actually watched the games. Yeah. Can you tell us, like, your impression of the Japanese league, how it's evolved, and give people a bit of an intro to it have you ever been to japan i haven't sadly please do one day whether it's business or pleasure because it's um it's an absolutely amazing place um i i love it i love the league i love their i love their attitude to sport i i largely love their their attitude to to life as well um what do I think of the league? I think it is incredibly entertaining rugby. I think they've found a format that allows them to be true and fair to their local players and talent and supporters, whilst at the same time providing opportunities for, for world-class players to experience their culture, but also enrich and improve their rugby and, and make it more of a spectacle. Uh, to give you to give you an idea of that, the players are, are cut up or in, into three categories. So you've got a category A, which is a, a Japanese eligible international. You've got a category B, which is a foreigner who hasn't been capped for their country, who could potentially be capped for Japan in the future. And you've got a category C, who is you know your rock stars, your Lou Diagas, your Cheslin Colbys, your Peter Stefatoys, Ardi Surveyors, Aaron Smuths, etc. <laughs> so, eighty percent of your squad has to be category A's. You're allowed um, in your entire squad of forty, fifty odd, or whatever. You're allowed up to nine foreigners but you're allowed no more than three category Cs. That's usually what squads do. They'll have six category Bs and three category Cs. Your category Bs are very often lock forwards and outside halves. Uh, same with your category Cs, really, because there aren't many, you know, six foot six, six foot seven, six foot eight Japanese guys. Yeah. Um, uh, but in terms, of, in terms of the other positions, props, hookers, Back rowers, scrum halves, centres, wingers, the, the the talent is is great. They pride themselves on their fitness. So the co-commentators that uh, that I've worked with, Shane Williams and Tinas Delport, both absolutely brilliant, but of course both have played out there. And they're like, one of the main differences is their fitness, mate. When, I, when we went out there to play, never done so much running. We had to lose kgs because it's just relentless. In terms of the style of play, hardly any box kicks yes they'll catch and drive from the line out five ten meters out but if it doesn't go over mall wise first phase they'll go edge to edge there's none of this exit your chiefs pick and go pick and go pick and go wait for the advantage pick and go pick and go try they just play off the cuff it is loose it is fun it is high skill level um it's not as it's not as physical as a South African team in in the URC or one of the top top 14 teams but in terms of an 80 minutes of rugby where you've got two teams who are going to try and score tries who are going to entertain a crowd and the crowds are amazing by the way they're getting 25 30,000 at, at, at these games every Saturday in the top division um, and in terms of a of a development tool where they are playing true to a style of rugby that the national team will then go on to play i think the league is is brilliant that that is definitely one of my takeaways from when i watched uh steel versus sun goliath the other day was uh, yeah i did think oh this is like watching the japanese national side they they, yeah. they run a lot of the same shapes so someone like Bryn gatland then is category b then not yes cat c. he's not ah. cat c which means uh without wanting to sound cynical 
he's a little bit cheaper. Uh, I'm sure he'll be on a good wedge. He's had an outstanding season, by the way. He's been yeah. absolutely brilliant. He's up over 150 points now. I think he's averaging around 13 a game when he's been against a... He tucked Bowden Barrett in earlier in the season as well. Completely outplayed him. Um, and he's been he's been one of the signings of the season, actually. One of my favourite... My, probably my ultimate favourite Japanese player at the moment is Matsuda, the fly half for Wild Knights. Yes. What a team they are. 12 yes. and 12 at the top of the standings. Yep. Yep, scored over 400 points in those. Uh, no, scored over 600 points. Their points difference is over 400 points as well. Uh, they are going to take take some beating. I mean, look, it's it's like it's like the Premiership or like the URC. It is a playoff. It's the top four will go through uh, at the moment. I think it's Sun Goliath, Cannon Eagles, Brave Lupus, uh, Lupus's Wolf, Wolf, Wolf. Yes, and uh, and the Wild Knights mm. and and playoff rugby does weird things to people but yeah wild nights are very very good yeah bristol bears will tell you all about playoff rugby oh right. yes um so fun question before we move on to the next category of the show um oh, i want to know on. the best commentary box that you've ever sat in and the worst one the one that you were like why i'm in why am i in this garden shed um the be- <sighs> the best is in the, the, the most they're... lush one, the most plush, the poshest one, the one where you're like, Ooh, "Oh, this is nice." Okay, I mean, there there are a couple for there are a couple for sentimental reasons that that are amazing. So, even though it's not the most luxurious, um, the principality was was pretty special to commentate there, and also I did Melrose Sevens last year, which is where Bill McLaren did a lot of his commentaries from. So that was. That was really historic. In terms of um, a vantage point where you're going tonight, King's Home is amazing because you're right up the top and you've got a panoramic view of everything. You've got a. You've That's got not a the one where you climb a ladder to get up there, is it? There's quite a few where you've got to climb a ladder to to get up there. Um, that one is no, it's a it's a staircase actually. You've got to go back into the stand and up a staircase. Um, there's a ladder at the stoop. The, at at um, at Sandy Park, there's a drawbridge. And so you've got to climb up this this steel step drawbridge. And as soon as the game kicks off, then they pop the drawbridge up behind oh, no. you. Yeah. So if I you can't be if, very fire regs. Well, if you need a pee, you're in you're in trouble. Um I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna say the worst. Sorry, excuse me a second. Always mute your mic to cough. It's uh, it's courtesy. Where where is the, the most the most plush. Where is the most plush? I'll tell you where is a tight squeeze is Parker Scarlet's. Really? To the point where last time last time we were there, it was a really busy one. So I was doing it for BBC Wales. So I had Kenneth Davis. I can't remember who was co-commentating with him. I was with James Hook for BBC Wales. Next to us was via play, which is Martin Gillingham, Shane Williams, and Richard Hibbard. God, Gloucester are getting a lot of mentions, aren't they? With you going yeah. there tonight, Kings Home and Hibbard, it was so tight that Richard Hibbard was sat on my lap. <laughs> He's about 130 kg. I, I, there, are, there are times when I've watched, it must be the BBC feed I've watched, and I can hear Sean Holly because he likes to he likes to shout a bit. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Up, and I can hear, I can hear him doing the via play commentary on the BBC microphone. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, so tight, quite a tight squeeze there. I'm not going to say the worst because I don't think it's fair. And anywhere, anywhere you get to do it, like it's a, it's it's a it's a privilege. It really is. But at six ways, RIP was the Warriors. So you've got the main stand and then they've got the smaller stand with that sort of concaved roof. Um, you, you you climb up a ladder to that one or you can go the, the long way round. But there's a potting shed with the front kicked off that's perched on top of the stand. And that's where you do the commentary from. And it was so sketchy. It was so sketchy. <laughs> but it was... Um, 
yeah, it was absolutely, absolutely awesome. All right, fantastic. So, right, we're going to do a bit of a game now. Going to do something okay. a bit fun. So I'm going to make sure that I don't get you in trouble because I don't want to do that. Oh, don't cost gosh, you you know, I've got myself in enough trouble. So yeah, I'm going to share I'll... my screen. So, so give me a shout when you can see it. Okay. Uh, the moment I can see you. And oh, here we go. No, then I saw me. Oh, God, you are going to get me in trouble. So this is so this is ranking tier list. We love a tier list on the Internet. It's a tier list of rugby competitions, rugby leagues, rugby cups. So okay. I've only picked 10 to be going on with. If anybody's wondering, where's Curry Cup Division 2? Where's Super Rugby ah, South yeah. America? It's, it's, I've tried to tailor it to our wonderful guests today so that we'll get someone else on in the future and we'll do some of the other broader ones maybe for a bit further afield. But So I've got 10 leagues to be talking about and then I'm going to split them into five categories. The categories are this. So the top is best league. Now, I should tell you, uh, Dave, that we are a very heavy um, URC propaganda podcast. So there is a right <laughs> answer. Um, there's a good time, no alcohol required which uh, some people may recognize from a well-known uh, film review YouTube channel. Uh, third category is not what it was, so maybe that's probably the meanest one. Uh, then there's finding its feet, so maybe a newer tournament that's still on the up. And then there's hipsters only. So only if you are a hardcore, you're too, you are too cool to watch um, the big stars. You have to watch something that no one's ever heard of on a Wednesday or Thursday night. This is the league for you. There is, you just, don't have to I have one say, in every. Can I? Yeah, can on. I just say, right? You've put hipsters only at the bottom there. Bearing in mind, I live in East London, and you're wearing a flat cap. Like, what are you playing at here? No, it's no, it's saying hipsters only is something that I would watch. If you'd like to, if you'd <laughs> like to classify hipsters only as something that only Hugh could enjoy, that's completely ah, fair. The, the, that's the, completely the fair. The thing is, the thing is usually like hipster, hipster rugby, hipster football, hipster whatever. I, I like to think of it as something that is incredibly enjoyable, but only a select. So if it's hipsters only, I'd be like, right, well, this is the thing the hipsters are watching. I think you should watch it. It's outstanding. But anyway, we will let let's go let's go through these. Let's go through these and, and see how much see how much trouble and fun we can Th there's have. no rule to say that one has to be in each category so everything okay. can go in best league if we absolutely think we can convince ourselves of it so yeah. first one your specialist subject your favorite one bucks super rugby will combine men's and women's this applies to both oh can you slide that i can i can I, oh, I take is that, it oh place, cool but... we're doing this live yeah nice yeah, uh, yeah. you can slide that up into best league and let me tell you why uh Bucks Super Rugby is the hinterland, the conduit, the silver lining between the glory days of amateur rugby and professional rugby that we love. It's probably the last opportunity that any player has to play for the club or the team that they have chosen to be a part of. You've got a short period of time, two years, three years, four years, if you're on a longer course and you get selected as a fresher. And you have got that that target, whatever that target is. So for Nottingham University, it's to get to the playoffs. For Exeter University, it's to win it three times in a row. For for Bath University, it's to win it for the first time in the Bucks Super Rugby era. But those targets are there. And every Wednesday, it is so obvious how much it means to every player in Bucks Super Rugby and the Women's National League, which we're hoping, if a few little tweaks are made, will become Buck Super Rugby women in the next season or so. Um, the talent pathway is absolutely incredible. I think come the British and Irish Lions Tour, we'll probably have our first BSR Lion in this mm -hmm. Uh, in this in this coming tour. In terms of the Six Nations, the only team in the men's who haven't capped a Buck Super Rugby player are Ireland. Um, but obviously they've got a lot going on over there. But France have, Italy mm -hmm. have, Scotland have, Wales have, uh, and England have. And I think with all of the uncertainty around professional and semi-professional rugby at the moment, with fewer opportunities for players to go professional younger, for the relationships the professional and semi-professional clubs have got now, 
with the academic institutions and just the fact that as a young man or a young woman you get to expand your horizons your rugby horizons and your non-rugby horizons i think buck super rugby is the best league if i wasn't wearing this microphone i'd drop it oh there you go then so that's ah. gone straight in there where where shall we go next uh let's go for the one that we discussed earlier japanese league one where are you thinking uh finding its feet but okay. only be- only because i think it's an incredible platform and i actually think in terms of a league in terms of a format as i explained earlier it's found its feet but now it is time that the global audience joined so as i said tvnz are on board uh, espn africa are on board because of the the all blacks and the Springboks that are playing um at the moment there's not particularly strong uh well, there's there's no professional women's division in Japan, uh, but I think as soon as the rest of the world catches up, then then yeah, Japan Rugby League one, maybe hipsters, maybe hipsters only at the moment. But either way, well, it's on it at five thirty in the morning, so that is quite hipstery. Yeah, and hipsters can come straight in from the from the shared rave and uh, and tune in, can't they? All right, let's go <laughs> hipsters only, but that is that is meant in the most complimentary of terms. Yes, yes. There's no 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 losers here. Right. Uh, next. Ooh, where should I go? Super rugby. Right. So this is an interesting one. So it depends whether you want to say super rugby Pacific and sort of the post lockdown super rugby is a new thing, or are we comparing it to Super Twelve? Yeah, back we in are. The day? So you can we keep are. it in. You can keep it in in not what it was, please. Um, I watched Moana Pacifica versus Reds this morning. It was not a good game. I will be honest. I look. I don't want to be. I don't want to be disrespectful. But I also think this is a, this is a bad season for it as well, isn't it? Because we are entering into the next World Cup cycle, so a lot of the top Southern Hemisphere players will be exploring opportunities to play elsewhere. South African teams are involved in the URC now. Um, Australian rugby is in a rebuild they haven't had particularly positive press around the disciplinary decisions uh involving a few teams in the last couple of weeks which i think is a, a very light way of putting it um that is not to say that there is a an astonishing depth of talent in those teams and in those countries but i think it is probably fair to say that super rugby is is not what it was all of our south african listeners will be delighting at that because they lo- they love to think that the Kiwis can't cope without them. And I'm sure they do <laughs> oh, um, Shout out to the Saffers. Good guys. Yeah. Right. Let's go championship rugby next. So you were at Bedford before. I have to say that I'm back in Cov this year. And I know they're very close Are to you? each other in the league because I went to Cov Uni. I, where I lived in first year was literally three minutes walk from the Butts. So oh, I'm really? back in Cov this year. Evening, that... I've, I've lost something like three of the last six seven games Even, so it's not the walkover that it normally was i think one of those is premiership cup to be honest but, yeah one was against leicester tigers but ealing trail finders they always provide a team with the biggest moment of the season last year it was coldy this year it's london scottish so uh, yeah i saw that so yeah they they they've got a hell of a thing going over at ealing but every now and then every now and then uh greatly good time no alcohol required um there are some barriers to entry for rugby for a lot of people. A lot of them are financial. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am going to Bedford Blues this weekend. Tickets are, well, I, I say affordable, and I understand that that's a sliding scale, but it's not as expensive as going to see, I don't know, Saracens or Northampton Saints or Scarlets or Ospreys. They'll have about 3,000 there. There won't be a massive queue for the bar. The atmosphere will be good. You can get really close to the action. It's an historic club, and it's a league that's full of historic clubs like London Scottish and Coldy. I mean, what they've managed to do at Coldy is absolutely remarkable. It's not been without it's not been without strife, of course. Jersey going bankrupt yeah. absolutely sucks, but it's a great league. It's full of talent. It's full of incredibly dedicated people. It's full of great stories. And if you went to watch a championship game, because unfortunately, 
there's not a lot of broadcasting and live streaming around it at the moment. I think you'd mm. really, really enjoy it. And the players that play in it thoroughly enjoy it. So good time. No alcohol required. Fantastic. Right. Next, let's go for a big gun. Top 14. Well, so, it, if you're talking glamour, for uh, me, nothing beats the top 14 for glamour. No, you, you, you are you are absolutely right. Um, and I think there are some premiership players who are going to the, the top 14 and pro de deux next season. Some of them haven't been announced yet. And it's like, yeah, of course, of course you're going there. And nobody, nobody does a home game quite like Racing, do they? No, they, they, uh, they, uh, they like to stand out, definitely. Uh, you can put that in good time, no alcohol required, because we have already decided uh, what we can the have best multiple best league. leagues. We can have multiple best leagues. Well, we could have multiple multiple best leagues, but in this instance, we won't. Yeah, I mean, top top fourteen, uh, top fourteen is just awesome, isn't it? Um, yeah, and I will be very like, come the end of this weekend, it'll be very interesting to see what the ceiling for some of the teams who are playing against top fourteen teams is. Mm, can't wait. Let's go now. Well, speaking of this weekend, let's talk about the Champions Cup. So the Champions Cup got a lot of bad press this well this year and the last couple of years because of the constant changes of format. And some people don't like the South African teams being included. We we're not amongst that on that on this podcast, but some people don't like it. It but it seems as soon as we actually you know the whistles went and the games started being played, a lot of that negativity fell away. So what what's your kind of view on it? Well, bearing in mind that you are a commentator on it, so you are, of course, have a vested interest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 look, that is certainly a petard that I can be hoisted by. But I I've been at how many Champions Cup games this year? So as a as a commentator, you did two Cardiff games, didn't you? I did the two. Well, I I did three Cardiff games, um, but two at the Arms Park, and the mm. atmospheres were absolutely amazing absolutely amazing for for Bath and Harlequins both sets of away supporters traveled in numbers the home supporters really got behind the team and look Cardiff's Cardiff's struggles on and off the pitch in terms of the finances and being able to put and keep a squad together have been very very public but the crowd and the supporters have really got behind them and they were amazing events I've I've been to the stoop this year for the Toulouse game, which was not a result that Harlequins would have been particularly pleased with, but the Glasgow Warriors game, I was there for that one on on Friday as well, and it was it was absolutely awesome. So yeah, you can like have have a moan, have a moan, get it off your chest, but whistle to whistle, we have had some outstanding games of rugby, some truly brilliant games of rugby, and particularly those. Um, initial weekends those pool phase weekends where you can plant yourself on your sofa in the pub i don't know at a ground wherever you want and watch three or four games of top draw rugby back to back doesn't get much better than that so let's give it a good time no alcohol required please let's go for it let's go for it right now let's go straight back down to the welsh premiership so like you i've been really getting into the thursday night coverage if you need your rugby fix if you're an absolute rugby addict there's something there for free for people to watch on YouTube if they want. Um, and yeah, there, there's been a bit of there's a bit of uh, drama and narrative to it as well now with all of the the neathness that's been going on online. Have you um, been approached to do a neath video? I haven't. I'm not on Cameo though, so maybe oh, that's of course. Of course. <laughs> um, so what are we saying for the Welsh Prem then? Where, where's this going? Well, now, I, 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 let, well let, let me just sorry to interrupt you. No, no, please, question, please, but. The fact that it's it's changed, we're going to the EDC um, now, I think is maybe a suggestion that we should put it in not what it was because it is becoming something else as of next year. Discuss. Well, I'll well, look, Ebervale versus Pontypool on Friday, Thursday, sorry, is going to be absolutely massive. So I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, well, no, I suppose next season we can put it in not what it was, but I feel as... I know it. Look, I know it's not, but I do feel as though not what it was is a bit of a it, it is the downer here. Let's go. Let's go hipsters only in the hope that some of your listeners decide that they want to have a watch of it, because 
Ebu Vale against Pontypool will be absolutely superb. I did Llandovery against Pontypool a couple of weeks ago, and it was 50-odd, 30-odd in the end. Some of the tries that Llandovery scored were as good as you'll see anywhere, like 22, 22 to 22, three phases, 10, 15 pairs of hands touching the ball. It is it is good rugby. I think the, the gap between URC and Indigo Premiership is bigger than the gap between Gallagher Premiership and the RFU Championship. And yeah, hopefully, I agree with that. And hopefully, with the with the changes, whatever they settle on, if they can close that gap, so players are able to make the step up from Indigo Premiership into one of the regional teams because they're playing a, a slightly more a slightly more competitive competitive is the wrong word slightly higher standard of rugby every week. I think that would be a lot more helpful for the Welsh game. I agree. I agree. Although. I think what would be more helpful to the Welsh game is if the Scarlets would pick Charlie Titcombe. Um, oh, don't. Charlie Titcombe, actually, is... Uh, I've got him involved in a couple of commentaries. He's going to be doing the Buck Super Rugby really? final with Tom Lauday, and he's going to be doing England students against France students at Coventry in a couple of weeks' time. Ah. So, uh, yeah, you're... Uh, one of your favourite crowds. Hey, we love we love Charlie. I think he's a super talented ten. Uh, in ter- yeah, in terms of Scarlets, I think he he kicks a lot more than yep. uh, Sam Costello and uh, and Johan. So at the moment, that's not fitting in with how they play. But I think he's I think he's great. Yeah, he, he he's, great as well. he's the hipster's choice. He's the hipster's choice at ten, big time. Yep, I couldn't agree more. Right, let's talk about URC then. So, look, as I said, look, it's a foregone conclusion. <laughs> podcast. But um, what's your favourite thing about the URC? What What's the thing that that you think you know? It's got a lot of naysayers, particularly in Wales. But what's the one thing you would say to someone? Look, it's brilliant for this. I look, and again, I've got a vested interest here because I cover URC. One of the things I love about the URC is the fact that there are so many brilliant teams from so many culturally different rugby parts of the world who go toe to toe every week. One of the things I that frustrates me about the URC is the fact that every now and then you can predict a result. Uh, and that's because of player welfare and you can't just play every player every week until they can until they can barely stand. So sometimes, particularly with the regions um, when the when the WRU were controlling minutes, then a mm. team would have to go away to Leinster or Bulls, and you'd think, oh no, this is going to be a this is going to be a tough one. And yeah, there are there are learnings from it, and players will improve as a result of being subjected to rugby at that level. But unfortunately, it wasn't a contest. When it is a contest, my God, what a league! What a yeah. what a brilliant league! Um, yeah, what phenomenal! And some of the some of the best some of the best players who play the game play in that league, and it's it's oh. as simple as that. I think it's it's really exciting to see. And look, your South African supporters are gonna are gonna love this. It's really exciting to see South African teams doing so well. It's really it's really exciting to see. South African players with an opportunity to play in South Africa, because I do think that the Gallagher Premiership and, you know, some of the some of the Welsh regions and, you know, even the top 14, if you took the South African players out of those leagues, then my goodness me, where would you where would you be? Their, their talent pool is so deep. Uh, do you know what? I wasn't going to do this, but I use one example. personally. I think the Welsh national team would be much stronger if you pick Tom Boater at tight head prop. Ooh, Osprey's fans will be loving that. Well, um, but but that's that's my opinion because if if I was putting a team together, I like a tight head who scrummages. I don't care if yeah. he puts his hands on his hips and walks to the next scrum. If he can win me scrum penalties or make sure that we don't concede scrum penalties, I'm happy with that. 
I but think, if you I think, think there's a lot of people who'd agree. But if you think where he would sit in the pecking order of South African tight heads, bearing in mind Wilco Lowe is one of the best I've ever seen with my own eyes, and he can't get a cap, that that shows you how deep they are. So, you know, the fact yeah. that there are opportunities for Welsh and Scottish and Irish and Italian teams to be competitive with South African teams in the same division. Like, what, what could he possibly be upset about for that? I couldn't agree more. Let's do the uh, PWR next, the Pro League or the, the Premiership Pro. Women's Rugby League. Uh, good time. No alcohol required. Um, it's not It's not what it was because it's improving. The Premier 15s was, was absolutely awesome. Um, but Premiership Women's Rugby, a rebrand, it puts more power in the hands of the clubs. It puts more power in the hands of an independently led uh, organization. It's got a broadcast deal. Uh, mm -hmm. If you watch it, it looks, it's the first time that club women's club rugby has looked like it belongs on television. Not in terms of what's happening between the white lines, because that quality has been there for absolutely years. But right now, if you tune in on a, on a Saturday or a Sunday and you watch the game that is offered up by TNT, it looks and sounds amazing. They've got they've got great people fronting it. They've got, you know, Sarah Elgin and Laura Jane Jones, who are recognisable, dedicated, talented um, sort of lead females. You've got Claire Thomas and Nick Heath, who are leading a lot of the commentaries and Johnny Hammond has been involved as well. You know, people who've been sunk deep in the women's game for years. Um, the Red Roses are arguably the best team on the planet and we get to watch yep. them every week, but we're also able to, to bring in talent from the best of the Welsh, the best of the Welsh uh, players, the best of the Irish. We've got some of the best of the South Africans. We did have some of the best Australians as well, but they've headed back to to strengthen the club game there. I think it is unquestionably the the best domestic women's division on the planet. Unfortunately, Buck Super Rugby in the Women's National League exists, so it's not in the best league category, but it is a good time and no alcohol required. Yeah, well, none of the other leagues on this list have Cecilia Tuopolotto play in it. So Correct. I'm just saying. She's um, uh, she's she's awesome, by the way. What uh, what a human being! And a massive a massive shout out to um, to Dan Murphy and all the coaches at Gloucester Hartbury as well, because when I first started watching Cecilia, I was like, oh my goodness me, who is this? And she was a, a ball carrying, Saturday ruining second rower back then. But they've, you know, they've worked with her and managed to turn her into a world class front row. So huge credit to her for putting that work in and and huge shout out to those guys for for helping her to do it as well. What a player, what a human. Absolutely. And then last one, Premiership Rugby. So a lot of people would say that purely by the three clubs going bust, it's not what it was. Although I would say that actually concentrating the talent pool a bit has probably helped some of the standard maybe i don't know what's your thought on it bath a second saracen's a third quinn's a fourth bristol a fifth exeter a sixth leicester a seventh and sale sharks a eighth how many teams is that one two three four seven teams good maths all seven of those teams have won eight and lost six this season yep what a league what a league we're going so there are four regular season games remaining and realistically eight of the 10 teams can still make the playoffs and the team who are currently top could finish outside the top four and the team who are sick i mean mathematically sales sharks could still finish top but it would take a lot to go on mm. i think in terms i i don't think there is a more competitive league in rugby is there if there is tell me i'll watch it every week i think from top to bottom well not quite bottom but top to most of the way down i, th I don't think there's as much of a anyone can be anyone league no yeah yeah I don't, i'm just uh so even ninth place so so gloucester they've only got four victories this season but outside of premiership rugby in the prem cup and in the challenge cup they've looked practically invincible i mean they're playing the ospreys tonight You've got to. Are you, are you in the shed? I don't know where I am. I'm, someone else has got my ticket. <laughs> OK, OK. E either way, it's a great place to 
to watch rugby. I, yeah, I mean, Gloucester could quite conceivably win a trophy this year. Um, look, I'm a fan of promotion and relegation. Call me, call me British. I think it's great, and and maybe mm-hmm. uh, and, and maybe one day the the Premiership goes back to that. But for the time being, what an immensely, what an immensely competitive league. Stick it in good time, no alcohol required. Excellent. Again, it's, Excellent. It, it is unlucky that that uh, Buck Super Rugby and the the URC, by proxy, I hasten to add, uh, exists because um, yeah, the Prem, the Prem is absolutely awesome. And look at some of the occasions as well. Like I, I again, full disclosure, I do a lot of stuff for Harlequins. I love Harlequins, but in a couple of weeks. They're hosting Northampton Saints at Twickenham. That's awesome. The 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 big game this year, and now they do it as a double header with uh, the PWR team as well. Like they mm. there are clubs and, and Saracens uh, going over to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium as well. I mean Leicester Tigers they could probably sell out a stadium double the size. Bristol Bears at, at Ashton Gate. There are clubs that, despite the fact that the, the finances might not make as much sense as we'd like them to, are really bloody trying at the moment. And yeah, yeah, I, I think certainly on the pitch as well. The, the, like the prem, the prem is awesome. And looking at looking at all these great leagues that we've had a chat about, there are a lot of haters. But I think it's important to realise that every player who runs out in those leagues is really bloody trying, and the vast majority of the people who are who are sat in the boardrooms and working in the club shops and pulling the pints behind the bar and making sure that the changing rooms are clean and that there's enough bandages in the medical supplies are, are really trying as well. So yeah. it's it's easy to be down on rugby, but but I'm certainly not. Well, fantastic. So there, for all our YouTube viewers, you can see the uh, uh, standings in front of you, but I'll just read them out for our audio listeners. In best league, we got Box and URC. Good time, no alcohol required. It's Championship, Top 14, Champions Cup, PWR, Premiership Rugby. Not what it was. The only one in there is Super Rugby. Nobody in finding its feet. And then hipsters only is Japan League One and Welsh Premiership. What a set of competitions that is. Yes. So I think I should have stopped sharing now. So you, you have, you have. Seen me. You have. Okay, so you, we, we mentioned finances there. So serious penultimate question. How, how does club rugby... Not international rugby. How does club rugby prosper? Because at the moment, it feels like international rugby. Everyone is just putting all their eggs in that basket, and it is the it is the only money generator in the game. And club rugby is being pushed and pushed and pushed aside in order to enable these international games, which are what is making the money. So, how do we get out of that oh, struggle? God, oh, you do realise that I'm just a bloke who shouts the names into a microphone, don't you? I mean, my goodness, I sort out my own finances, then maybe I can <laughs> sort out club rugby's finances. But look, you talk about international rugby there, like, like that's a, a gravy train. But beyond a certain number of countries, that's not the case either. So the Rugby Europe Championship this year was was absolutely brilliant. Georgia won it again, of course they did, but they were massive moments. Belgium getting the victory over uh, Portugal. over Portugal, who ended up getting to the final again and, and coming up short, but playing some awesome rugby and blooding some new talent. Um, Spain, they're really looking forward to, to hoping to qualify for the next Rugby World Cup. And they, they, finished, they finished third in the end. But these are all really talented countries of really talented players and you can put you know Romania in there and Netherlands are growing and Germany are growing and they've got great coaches and some investment from world rugby but as unions they're they're not making massive money but I, look I know I know the point you're making like the home nations the six nations and if you pack out Murrayfield or Twickenham or the Principality or the Aviva then hopefully you're going to be able to generate enough money and it's going to trickle down and it's and it's going to help it's going to help to grow the game. Um, in terms of club rugby, it's really, really hard because there are so many competing factions for people's continually dwindling pots of personal cash. Um, even though it means, even though it means that the say Gallagher Premiership clubs might not be as competitive in the Champions Cup. I, I like a salary cap. I know that that doesn't necessarily reflect 
as a business and i know that some clubs have opted not even to spend up to the cap because trying to generate that kind of revenue just is a little bit beyond them at the moment but what it does mean is you've got a baseline cost this is how much it's going to cost for playing staff this is how much it's going to cost to maintain our our buildings our stadium our training facility or whatever and, and you can work backwards from there um i don't think anybody who watches a good game of rugby regrets it and i look i don't watch as much football as i used to but there was a time where i watched a load of football but if i'm honest with myself i've probably watched a lot more bad games of football over the years than good games of football i don't Mm. think anybody really wants to have a conversation around that because if you watch football if you watch your if you watch your team then It almost doesn't matter because you're going to get really happy or really sad about it either way, regardless of whether it's a great game or a bad game. It doesn't matter if you lose a really good game. You're still going to be pissed off if you. Sorry, if you lose a really good game, you're still going to be pissed off. If you win a really bad game, you're still going to be over the moon. Um, I think in in rugby, it needs to go a little bit beyond that because you are not going to win every week. So it needs to be experiential yeah you need to be frustrated if your team loses but you still there still needs to be something there that makes you want to come back the next week or switch on the tv or or watch online the next week and and i just don't know i i just don't know what that is because the product is amazing there's rugby somewhere for everybody like we said the premiership is so competitive japan rugby league one is a hundred mile an hour, like brilliant, headless chaos. And I think anybody who is, you know, emotionally invested in it can see it. But how do you get people to become emotionally invested in it? And you've asked me how, and I, I, I genuinely don't know because the product is there. The players are there. The athletes are there. The stories are there. They are all They are all there. There are so many brilliant, brilliant people involved in men's and women's rugby. Great characters, great stories, great athletes. And I, yeah, I just don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it needs a, if it needs a cultural shift. I don't know if it needs a marketing shift. I don't know if it's money or do you just take a baseline of where you are now? accept that and realize that that's rugby's place Ooh, big topic big topic yeah i think that's <laughs> yeah well one, you one asked for, the question know, mate one one for the listeners to to mull over uh, as they as they carry on their day after listening to this right last <laughs> question then um what you are a well-traveled man been to all places all over the world covered lots of incredible rugby matches spoken to a lot of incredible rugby people what is on your rugby bucket list oh my goodness me um so oh, there's a few things there's a few things i if if something if something happened and i was never able to commentate again i've done some pretty awesome stuff and i and i wouldn't have any regrets but i've never done a gallagher premiership game for broadcast and i'd absolutely love to uh i did a men's six nations game um for itv so i as i alluded to earlier audio description blind and visually impaired um supporters i trained in that for football and i got to do that for itv for the england versus ireland game where marcus smith slotted the drop goal wow, so that was man. that that was amazing um but i'd love i'd love to maybe one day do a a, a men's or women's or men's and women's i'd love to do six nations games um and I'd love to be a part of a Rugby World Cup. If they happen, amazing. And I'll carry on doing what I do. And if those opportunities come up, then I will I will grab them with both hands and do the best job that I can. But I've got I've got no regrets. I love uh, I love talking about rugby whenever, wherever, to whoever. So it's a pretty good life and I'm very happy to live it. It sounds it. Well, Dave, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the Pirate Rugby Podcast. I hope our listeners and viewers enjoyed it. It's been fantastic for me to learn lots of things from you today and I'm sure we'll keep in touch going into the future. I hope so. And super rugby fans, um, send all your hate mail to these guys. All the best.
Yeah, please do. Okay, thank you, everybody. And we'll speak to you next week. Cheers.